One day, Jesus is coming into town to meet a person just like us, even though we might not think he's anything at all like us. I'm talking about Zacchaeus. Luke describes it in Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. One of the biggest obstacles in people's understanding of God and his acceptance of them is this fear. Am I good enough? You know, will God accept me because of how I've lived my life? Will God have anything to do with me after what I've done? And so we believe that we're unacceptable and there's nothing we can do to make it up to God. Now that part of our thinking is true, that there's nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable to God. But many times people try. They believe if I live a good life, good moral life, and do all these good things, then maybe God will be pleased with me. Or you'll hear them say, I'm trying to be a good person. Or they might even say that about somebody else. She's such a good person. And so we end up comparing ourselves to others and see that we're doing maybe a little better, maybe even a lot better than most of the people we know. And so we can start thinking, I must be a good person. But in the back of our mind, there's vo this voice that still questions, but am I good enough? Because when we compare ourselves to other people, we end up using the wrong measurement. When we, but, we, we care, but when we compare ourselves next to God, and the goodness of God, we're not even in the same neighborhood. Nobody would dare think they're as good as God unless they're delusional. Here's something you need to realize. Jenny Allen says this. She says, anyone can get to heaven no matter how messy his or her life. And by the same token, anyone can be kept out regardless of all of his or her fancy goodness. If I'm so messed up, why would God want anything to do with me? Now, we can put on appearances and make it look like we're godly and spiritually minded, and why wouldn't God want to be around us? Well, I once heard Michael Dye, who spent a lot of his life with addicts and broken people, share his shock when he started to do ministry in the church. He was used to working with messed up people whose lives looked all messed up. But then when he started working with Christians, he noticed this difference. He said, how could people who look so good be so messed up? He was finding out the truth of these Christians' lives. They were acting like they had it all together when the truth was they were just as messed up as people who didn't know Christ to begin with. We don't want to, people to see us in our messiness. Like Adam and Eve, we try to hide it. We try to hide in it. We try to hide from it. We try to keep other people from finding out the truth about us. You know, what would people think of us if they found out? So the fear of being exposed keeps us from being vulnerable, from being known, from actually being loved, from being forgiven and restored. If we let somebody see the inside of us, after taking a hard look, they might say, well, I don't want to get anywhere near you. And so they run away from us and stay away. And this is 
This is one of our biggest fears in life, that we will be left alone in our mess. But the church should be one of the safest places to be honest about the messiness of your life. The church should be the first place people go to speak the truth of their life and experience the love and forgiveness of God. Yet in so many cases, it's the last place you'd ever want to go. Why feel unforgiven and worse for having your struggles? And so instead of going to the church with their struggles, many people go to other places to share about their lives, places that are not necessarily good for them. The church can become messy in the wrong kind of way by ending up as a, a Pharaoh, Pharisee factory where people can't be honest, where it's wrong to have struggles and deal with unwanted thoughts and feelings and behaviors. In the Gospels, we see that Jesus has little interest in games of pretense. He wants people to be real, to be honest with him. Those who choose to get real with him about their hidden life, whether caught up in the act of sin like the adulterous woman, or living in shame like Zacchaeus, the people who get honest with him are the ones who experience the most profound transformation. We see this time after time when people get honest with Jesus. That's when real change happens. Nobody wanted anything to do with Zacchaeus. As a tax collector, that already made him unacceptable to everybody. The fact that he's asking and taking more than his fair share from people and his collecting is especially shameful. And as a short man, he's already feeling very self-conscious and perhaps being ridiculed for his stature. One thing's for sure, Zacchaeus is carrying around a lot of guilt and shame for how he's lived his life. Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, and Luke tells us that he climbs up in the sycamore tree because he's too short to see over the crowd. Now, I believe there's more to it than that. I think Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but he doesn't want Jesus to see him. He feels unworthy to get close to him. He's made such a mess of his life. Think how shocking it was when Jesus looks up, sees him, and I mean really sees Zacchaeus, heart and all, and he says to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. This is shocking to Zacchaeus. It has to be shocking to the crowd. Why would Jesus want to go to the home of a notorious sinner like Zacchaeus? That's because the truth that we all need to hear today is this. God meets us in our messy reality. Every moment is the right time and right place to meet God. God meets us right where we are. And the most surprising thing is that he meets us in our messiness. In the very place that we believe he'd want nothing to do with us. We can believe we need to hide from our mess and hide in our mess and at least hide it from God and everybody else. But what I mean by the messy reality of our lives is the internal state of our hearts. What's really going on inside of us. Becoming aware of it and being willing to bring it to Jesus without pretending or denying or hiding. God wants us to be aware of what's happening inside and outside of us including the messy truth. As Paul said to the Thessalonians, So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, you know, not, not awake to what's going on, but let us be alert and self-controlled. God wants us to be present to what's going on with us inside and out. When Jesus first meets one of his soon-to-be disciples, Nathaniel, he says to him, he says, Nathaniel, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Now he's probably alluding to the person in Psalm 32 too, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Jesus praises Nathaniel for his integrity because his inner world and his outer life are aligned. He's open and honest about who he is, including the messiness of his life. Jesus always values honesty over hypocrisy, a willingness to face our mess 
rather than finesse the truth about our mess. As James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is why Jesus came eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, because they were the people who were actually real with him about their sins, about everything. They were aware of their messy reality, and they didn't try to hide it from him. Jesus knows our tendency to be anywhere but right in the middle of our messy reality. That's why he spent so much time calling people to deal straight with him, to be honest about what they were feeling and needing from him. Robert Fulgram tells about officiating at a wedding. This wedding was huge. It was very expensive. There was an 18-piece orchestra, 24 bridesmaids and groomsmen. I mean, this thing was large. No detail had been left out. Finally, the day, came, the day came for the big wedding, and he describes the bride. He says, she had been dressed for days, not hours. No adrenaline was left in her body. Left alone with her father in the reception hall of the church, while the march of the matrons went on and on, she walked among the tables laden with gourmet goodies and anxiously sampled the food. First, the little yellow, pink, and green mints. Then she picked through the silver bowls of mixed nuts and ate out the pecans, followed by a cheese ball or two, some black olives, a handful of glazed almonds, a little sausage with a frilly toothpick stuck in it, a couple of shrimp blanketed in bacon, and a cracker piled high with liver pâté. To wash it all down, a glass of pink champagne. Her father gave it to her to calm her nerves. What you noticed as the bride stood in the doorway preparing to walk down the aisle was not her dress, but her face. It was completely pale white, for what was coming down the aisle was a living grenade with the pin pulled out. As she neared the front of the aisle, the bride threw up. And by threw up, I don't mean a polite, ladylike burp into a handkerchief. There's no way to no nice way to say it. She puked. Two bridesmaids were hit, as well as the groomsmen and the ring bearer. Well, they couldn't do the ceremony in that space anymore, so they moved everything into the reception hall to do the ceremony. He says, continuing, everyone still cried because of the sweet lay, the broom, the broom, yeah, the, the, how about the groom? The groom held his bride in her arms throughout the whole ceremony. And then he adds, and no groom ever kissed a bride more tenderly than he. You see, the church is the bride of Christ, and yet we're a mess. As one pastor I know, a spiritual leader whom I respect who has character and integrity, said, I'm a hot mess. The truth is, if we're being honest with ourselves, we're all a hot mess because of, of sin and the things that have happened to us. Like the groom with his bride, Jesus is tender and compassionate with us. Because of our stuff, it would make sense for him to give us space and distance himself from us. But instead, he draws near to us. The messiness we find in ourselves, and the messier we seem, the closer he seems to come. The more difficult our situation, the more present he is. He doesn't run away from us on our mess. He embraces us in our mess. God loves the actual you, who you are in your heart, not the face that you wear out in public or the idealized version of yourself. A common belief that we have in the church, and this shows up in a lot of places in our paradigm of reality and how it's different from God's, is that we believe that God can't stand to look upon our sin or to look upon us because of our sin. Now one of the places we get this false belief from is probably Habakkuk 1.13 
where the prophet says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. But when you examine the context of this passage, Habakkuk is not saying that God is so disgusted with people and their sin that he can't bear to look at them. The evil God can't look on is the evil being done to Israel. And he's going to deal with it. God is broken hearted over the evil that is being done to his people. And he does not turn away and abandon us in our sin. If God could stand to look at us, if God could not stand to look at us when we sin, then he would never be able to look at us. If God turned away from us in our sin, he would never find a reason to turn toward us. It is we who turn away from God, not God who turns away from us. It is possible to become a hardened and callous person by our sin, and so God, in those cases, might leave us to face the consequences of our sin. But that doesn't mean that God wants nothing to do with us. Like a good doctor, God does not detest the patient who has cancer. He detests the cancer in the patient. God isn't opposed to us. He's opposed to what sin and death do in us. God is not against us for our sins. He is for us against our sins. Scripture attests over and over that God is not driven away by our, our sinfulness. He draws close to us in the midst of our mess. When Adam and Eve hide after their sin, God comes looking for them and asks the question, Where are you? He comes looking for them and he makes a sacrifice for their sin, which foreshadows what Jesus did for us. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet confesses his sin in the presence of God. He says, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Isaiah's confession of sin prompts God to move toward him not away from him, to purify him, not condemn him. In Luke chapter 5, verse 8, Peter falls before Jesus and says, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. But instead, Jesus moves toward him and says to him, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. Instead of wanting nothing to do with Peter, Jesus wants him as his disciple and plans on using him to reach other people. Instead of walking away from Peter, Jesus wants to work through Peter. In Matthew 8, 11, 18, 11, Jesus says, The Son of Man comes to save what was lost. And in Israel, that day, that meant tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners. Jesus spent most of his time with them. His ministry centered around sinners. He was focused on being with sinners, not avoiding them. And so don't believe for a minute that God wants nothing to do with you because of your sins. He's done everything he ha can to bridge the gap between you and him. If God cannot meet us in our sin, where will he meet us? A man named Matt says, as a young Christian, I did not understand this. Every time I had an awareness of my sin, I felt shame, cut off and cursed by God. This feeling of God's absence wasn't rooted in reality. Rather, it came from a story I told myself about God, about myself, and about my sin. Behind all the toxic shame was a core belief that I never explicitly articulated, but nevertheless lives as though it was true. And it was this. God only loves me when I'm good. I would never have admitted this because I knew it wasn't correct, but my emotions and behavior revealed that this was what I actually believed. I lived as though God loved and idealized me, a future me, a less wretched and more faithful me, but not the actual me. Not coincidentally, I didn't love the actual me either. 
The revolution began in my life when I understood and internalized the truth that God doesn't love me because I'm good. God loves me because God is good. The God who is love, the God who is always present and at work, the God who looks like Jesus, that God loves the actual me right now in this very moment. Not the, the me on my best day or the me I wish I were or the me I thought I ought to be. God loves the busted and blessed, broken and beautiful me. And unless the broken, busted me, the actual me, receives and experiences the love of God in Jesus Christ, I will never experience how blessed and beautiful I am. The best thing in the world is to be who you really are before a God who's always there, waiting for you right in the middle of your messy reality. Mike Iaconelli said, messy spirituality is the audacity to suggest that messiness is the workshop of authentic spirituality, the greenhouse of faith, the place where the real Jesus meets the real us. A.W. Tozier said something similar. He said, how unutterably sweet is the knowledge that our Heavenly Father knows us completely. No talebearer can inform on us. No enemy can make an accusation stick. No forgotten skeleton can come tumbling out of some hidden closet to abash us and expose our past. No unsuspecting weakness in our characters can come to light to turn God away from us, since he knew us utterly before we even knew him and called us to himself in the full knowledge of everything that was against us. So Jesus comes running toward us not away from us. He says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. That's who he came for. But go and learn this, what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. It's not condemnation that brings conversion. It's mercy in the middle of our mess. Mercy surprises us with the love of God. The Lord, love, comes running for us when we feel most unlovable. The perfect example is seen in Jesus' conversation with an adulterous woman in John chapter 8. How does re Jesus respond to her? Well, here's how Pastor Sean Kilcauley sees this passage. He says, Jesus bends down and begins to write in the sand. There are many commentaries on, on exactly what he wrote. For our purposes, it is important that he bent down to write in the sand because he was placing himself within the woman's gaze. In moments of shame, we all tend to look at the ground. In this case, Jesus places his finger where the woman is looking, as if to say, look at me. I see you. I know who you are. I know who you really are. Then Jesus stands up and he says, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. You see, Jesus knows that none of us are without sin. Immediately he returns to write again on the ground. This time he catches her eye. I imagine the woman now allows herself to look at this person who's looking back at her with love. In that moment, the woman starts to notice that he looks at her differently than anybody else in the crowd. While the crowd looks in a way that confirms what she previously believed about herself, Jesus looks in a way that tells her something different. He looks into her and he looks at her with love. Jesus says to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She answers, No one, sir. Kilcauley says, This is the most crucial moment. This is the moment that reveals that mercy, in fact, 
leads to conversion because the no one, sir, includes her. She's no longer condemning herself. Somewhere in the look of love that entered into her a gaze of shame, she started to see herself the way Jesus sees her, rather than the way the crowd sees her. Only then does Jesus say, Go now and leave your life of sin. And so where does she go? She follows after Jesus. She shows up at the Pharisee's house and washes his feet with her tears. She's there at the crucifixion. She's the first to discover the empty tomb. She's transformed by his love. Every conversion, every true change in life comes when we let Jesus meet us in our messiness and love us just as we are. God can take your messes and bring a message out of them. God can take the tests in your life and give you a testimony. God can take any crisis that you're experiencing and show Christ through it. Mercy meets you in the midst of your mess and makes you into a son of God and a daughter of God, one with whom he is well pleased. Oh God, today may we come to you just as we are, to be honest about everything in our life, especially those things that are not the way that we want them to be, and certainly not the way you plan for them to be. Work in our hearts today, open us up to the truth of our lives, help us come to you not to receive common condemnation, but to experience your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, and to allow you to bring a, a transformation in our life that nothing else can. Thank you for receiving us as we are, for loving us so much that you gave your life for us so that we could live a different life in you. We praise you and worship you and live for you. In Jesus' name, 